We're going to go into today's scripture today, which comes from Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. We're going to read this in the ESV, and we encourage you to follow along uh, in your, your Bibles. We have Bibles, um, if you're here in person, that are under your chairs. Um, also, if you uh, want to follow along in a Bible app or your own Bible, especially for those who are at home, feel free to do that. Um, but if you're here in person, and if you feel comfortable doing this at home, we're going to read, uh, well, I'm going to read the scripture, but we're going to stand for the reading of God's word. And so if you could please stand as able, and I'll be reading the scripture for us, but at the end, we will all respond with thanks be to God. So may the Lord bless the reading of God's word for us today. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us, and he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, friends, uh, like I said, we're going to be doing a series over the next three weeks talking about Psalm 23. And so in many ways, we're going to be wrapping up our, our series on life, uh, which we've been doing uh, since the beginning of the fall. And so it's been quite a journey. And I mean, really, we could just do this for the rest of our lives. We could be talking about our lives. I mean, right? It's, it's just something that is always going to be relevant. Um, but something we've been focused on, uh, especially this summer as we've been working through the beginning of Acts, is we have been talking about the beginning of the church and what it means to do life together, not just life on our own, but with other people. And friends, I got to tell you that one of the obstacles, I think, to true community and fellowship is this idea that we think that some of us are worth more than others. Well, on one level, um, you know, we think that maybe, you know, based on our intellect or, you know, I don't know, how athletic we are, how good looking we are, or how tall we are, maybe there's ways that in this society we think we're better than other people. And there's different um, societies that have like social classes. Sometimes, you know, uh, like in India, they have the, the caste system where it's very, very well defined, you know, who's up here and who's down there and all, all these different kinds of things. But even in America, I think that we may not have like an explicit caste system, but there's always this sense that people who have more money are worth more. And in many ways, I think uh, that even if we think this isn't true, that there might be a part of us that wonders, what do we really have to offer if we don't have money. <laughs> that even in churches, right? I mean, there's like offerings and things like that, you know, tithing, you know? And um, sometimes, uh, you know, being in a college ministry, uh, it's just something that is, is a, just a reality that, uh, you know, we have a lot of students and students don't tend to have a lot of money, you know, and even young adults, after you're a student, you don't have a lot of money, you have a lot of debt. Right? <laughs> and maybe sometimes we come to church and we're like, well, I don't have a lot of money to give. You know, what do I really have to contribute to the community of Christ? And friends, I got to tell you that I think there's so much more than money. And we actually see that in this passage. We see uh, uh, Peter and John, who, as you know, they were just ordinary fishermen who were called to be disciples of Jesus, right? And in fact, they gave up that profession so that they could follow Jesus, right? As far as we know, you know, they gave up the nets. And yeah, there probably were people in the community who worked, right? But just my point is that 
Peter and John and the rest of the disciples were probably not rich, right? And this is a passage where they are going to the temple. And while they are going to the temple, they see a, a, a man who uh, was, uh, from birth, was not able to walk. And so, you know, maybe there was some kind of uh, physical ailment, or maybe he got sick when he was a kid, and that was something that could never be healed, right? And just all the physicians and all of the healers and all these people were not able to help this man. Nothing would help. No physical rehab, nothing like that. And so he's sitting by this gate, and he's there um, every day, we're told, right? A man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. So he's begging for money, right? And so... He sees Peter and John about to go into the temple, and he asked again for money. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and he said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Friends, uh, what do we have to give? You're going to see in this passage that Peter and John have no money. They have no money to give this man. Right? Maybe they have some money, but as you know that this early church was like pulling all their resources together to make sure that everyone had need, right? And at least, as far as we know, Peter and John don't have like bags of money that they carry around. They have no money, but they do have something to give. What do we have to give to one another in community? And we see this from the very beginning. Um, just want to uh, point out three things that I notice in this passage. And they're all related, right? They kind of intertwine. Um, but the first thing that Peter and John give to this man is their complete undivided attention. Did you notice that, right? That when they see this man, they say, look at us. And he does, right? It says he fixed his attention on them, right? He's just all there right? Ex because he's expecting to receive something from them. So probably for him, he's expecting money, right? But because he's expecting something, right, his whole attention, he's like, yeah, I'm a captive audience, right? Why is this important? Um, it, it, I think you see that quote that is, is attributed to uh, Will Schwab, and uh, it's something that I've actually heard other people say, Oprah, and, and if you go on the internet, it's just hard to tell who really said what, right? But it's the sentiment that the greatest gift you can give anyone is your undivided attention. Do you think that's true? Do you think that's true? Is that better than money? Is that better than, you know, uh, just so many other things that we tend to value? Undivided attention. Well, for one, I think undivided attention is a commodity that just a lot of us don't have anymore. You know, I, I know we talk a lot about like cell phones and I like to call them distraction devices, you know, and you got to think like this idea that this is the greatest gift you can give to another person, your complete undivided attention. Well, friends, the question is, are we doing that? Is that something that people ordinarily do? Or could it be that because we're so distracted, many of us, we're hardly ever there. Where? Here. We're hardly ever here. We're always somewhere else, right? Like our attention is, at least. You know, we're always thinking about other things. We're always thinking about, you know, the things that are worrying us, bills we have to pay, the projects that are overdue, right? All, all the different things like, oh, shoot, I forgot to call that person, you know? Or, or, or just, I don't know, maybe the fact is that just some of us, we, we feel awkward in different situations. You know, and many of us, we have a hard time even having a conversation with people we love, with our family and our friends, without at some point reaching into our pocket or looking down, right? I've heard of people that, uh, you know, when they meet together, um, I, I try to do this actually when I meet with other people. It's hard, I gotta tell you. You know, I, we just live in a world where we are so distracted. And, you know, I try to put my phone away, or at least, like, put it down, like, put the screen down so there's, like, no notifications, you know, like, you got a new message. <gasps> what if it's important? What if it's important? Friends, uh, you know, I, I know sometimes we feel like we're at the mercy 
of, of um, you know, all these things that are so distracting, you know? And sometimes, you know, when your phone buzzes or whatever, like, you feel like you have to answer, you know? But man, there was a time where, um, you know, we didn't have smartphones. We had dumb phones. You know, we had phones that were, like, connected to the wall. And, you know, um, I, I grew up with, uh, uh, I remember when we got, like, the portable phones that had to, like, recharge in a dock. But before that, we just had, like, wall phones. And it had, like, like a spiral plasticky thing. And it was, like, connected to the phone. And you could only go so far before you're just, like, you know? And if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, you actually had to be there. You actually had to be present, you know? And then at some point, I can't remember if it was in the 80s or whatever, but we got these wonderful things called answering machines. <laughs> and it was this thing that would record on a tape. They actually had tapes that would record the messages, you know, and you would, it, it was just like, you know, uh, the voicemail uh, where it's like, hey, you know, I'm not here. Please leave a message at the beep. Beep. And then you would have like 30 seconds to record your message because it was a tape, right? And it would run out. And there's only a certain amount of time that you could record this message. And the point is, friends, that there was a time where you could not get a hold of anyone at any time, right? And there was a time where we weren't so distracted by all these things. Now, I'm not saying that we need to go back to this simpler time because it's gone. We're never going to get there again. But I got to tell you, friends, how many times are we truly, truly present with other people? And what difference does that make? I, I, I share this story sometimes where um, I, I remember there was this kid in my youth group when I was a youth pastor in DC. And I remember trying to talk to this kid and it was so hard talking to this kid because whenever he would talk, he would like look down and he would mumble or sometimes when he wasn't looking down, his like voice would just trail off and he just would like not be there. You know, and I'd be like trying to follow the conversation. He's like, yeah, Pastor Steve, and then, you know, uh, earlier in this week, uh, I had a test, and then the test, I'm like, yo, man, I, I, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> Where are you? And, and, and the thing was that I realized, um, I, I saw the way he interacted with his dad, and I don't know if it was just his dad. I'm not trying to be too judgy, but I just noticed that whenever he talked to his dad, and what, I, actually, I, I had talk to his dad too sometimes. His dad was the kind of person that when you were talking to him, it was like he was somewhere else or there was somewhere more important for him to be. Like you talk to him, he'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh okay. All right, get to the point. Get to the point. And so the, the thing that I noticed is that, you know, maybe it's his dad, maybe it's other people, but I feel like this kid always got this message that when he talked to you, you wouldn't be fully listening. So why even bother? Why even bother follow, you know, finishing your sentences? You know, if you're not going to be there, then I'm not going to be there either. Right? And I got to tell you, there are so many times when I would come to church, and I, I, I noticed this, where I'm trying to be present with other people, but it's so hard. Why? So I'm so distracted. Man, I'm thinking about the sermon, and I'm thinking about point number two. Oh, point number two. Oh, I can't remember the transition. How am I get from point one to point two? And I'm worried, and I'm thinking about all the things that are going to go wrong. Oh, is the video going to play? Is the sound going to play? Is everything going to go smoothly? I'm thinking about all this stuff, all the different things that are in the air. And I'm talking to someone. They're like, hey, Pastor Steve. And I'm like, hi. And I'm not there. I'm not 100% there. I'm not giving them my full, undivided attention. Um, some of you guys know that uh, I had COVID. And uh, when I had COVID, uh, for about a week, I literally couldn't do anything. <laughs> I, I just, just like, I was so dizzy and uh, uh, just, just like confused. And I, I just sat there and just like, like just watch shows and movies like, like all day. And, and I, I just didn't move. And I just sat there. And I, I didn't do like any work for a week. And I got to tell you that one of the things that, that um, has been hard for me coming out of that week of like not doing anything is just feeling behind, right? Feeling like, oh my gosh, there's so much stuff that I didn't do. And it worries me. 
I think about it, right? Even this morning, I was thinking about this sermon. I was thinking about this message and just this idea that I was going to tell you. We need to be there with people. We need to give them our undivided attention. We need to be present. And this morning, I was sitting there thinking about the things that I, I, I needed to do. And, and I forgot that there's this practice that I used to do so I could be more present with people. And uh, what, it, I mean, some of the things like, uh, this is a longer message to figure out how do we live in this place where we can be fully with people? Well, friends, I got to tell you that I think the answer is to learn to live in the kingdom of God, right? I mean, this is a much longer message for us to go into what that means, how to do that. But just if I could just very simply distill this idea of living in the kingdom versus living in my kingdom. The kingdom is a place where the king is in control, right? So the kingdom of God is a place where God is king. What God says gets done. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the kingdom of God, right? So if you are living in the kingdom of God, then you do not need to worry about the outcome of events. Why? Because God is completely in control. Now, does that mean that you don't do anything? That you just sit there and you chill and you just veg out and you're lazy? Of course not, right? I mean, think about people who live in any kingdom, right? I mean, there's people who are like farmers and they're doing their work, right? And they're doing stuff, right? There's definitely still things we have to do. And it doesn't mean, you know, that we just like, like aren't active or whatever, you know? But the difference is, is that we are not responsible for the outcome. When you do something in the kingdom of God, you can trust that God is going to take care of that, right? Once you do it, it's gone. And by the way, many of us, we think we live in our own kingdoms, but we really don't have that much power. And that's the problem, right? So when you think everything depends on you, you're going to spend a lot of time worrying. You're going to spend a lot of time being distracted, thinking about things that you absolutely have no control over, right? Seriously, think about the test that's coming up. Like, yeah, you can study, but beyond that, when you're in bed and you're not studying, what good does it do you to worry about it? But we can't help it. Why? Because we think it all depends on us. And somehow, in, in the, 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 the imperfection of our minds, I mean, if I can call it a sickness of our minds, we think worrying about it does something. That's why we do it. We keep thinking about it, right? But I mean, there's, like, we worry about stuff that already happened, right? We, th we, we think about this stuff. We turn it over in our mind all the time. And so when you're sitting there with other people, so much of what we're doing when we're distracted when we're, we're like thinking about all these balls that are up in the air, is we are trying to be God. We're trying to be the king in charge of our own kingdom. And we think that we have to keep all these balls in the air. But I think living in the kingdom of God means you do your work, you do whatever God has called you to do, and you let it go. It's not your responsibility anymore, right? You don't have to control that outcome. And so, friends, this is something that I did this morning, something that I used to do a lot, and I remembered it this morning, so I wanted to share it with you, is that, you know, I sat there this morning, and I was about to get up, and I was like, yeah, you know, I want to be, like, fully present with people. I want to live in the kingdom of God. I know God's got this. I know God's in control. I don't need to worry about anything. But then I, I sat there, and I thought, like, oh, man, there's, like, all this stuff that I'm worried about, Right? And so, I mean, there, there, there's some stuff that I just like, oh, oh man, I don't want to forget to do this. Like, oh, I got to call this person. I got to take care of this thing. Oh, I was supposed to do this last week, but I was, you know, wiped out from COVID. So I got to go do this now, right? All this stuff. And so this is what I did. I scheduled it in my phone for when I could do it because I couldn't do it right then, right? Um, but I'm like, okay, Tuesday, you know, call this person, you know, do this thing, right? I scheduled it and... It's done. Well, it's not done. I mean, I'm going to do it on Tuesday, right? But I don't need to think about it anymore. What good does it do me to think about it on Sunday when I'm not going to do it till Tuesday? Right? It, it doesn't do me any good. You know what it does? It keeps me from being present on Sunday, 
today, right? Because I'm living somewhere else, right? You know, one of the things that I've learned to do in, in these messages is, you know, whatever I've prepared, whatever I've prepared, you know, up until Sunday, I just trust, you know, God, you're, you're going to use this, right? And to be honest, it's going to be much better for me to deliver a message where I'm kind of living in this kingdom reality rather than worried about every point. I just kind of trust that God is going to be with me and he's going to help me with this message. And even if it doesn't go perfectly, right? Like, yeah, you know, you, you do what you can and you let it go. And God will take that and use it. You know, but for me, one of the things that I want to do more and more is learn to be here with you now, right? And there are, are I mean, yeah, I preached many, many messages about how we can learn to live more in this reality, knowing that God is real and God is in control. God loves you. You don't need to control everything, right? And that's why we pray, right? Because when we pray, we unburden the things that we are so concerned about. We just give them to God, right? We trust that there's someone bigger and more powerful that can take care of those things, right? And so we're just always giving those things to God. But friends, learning to be with other people, giving them your undivided attention. I mean, it's something we're missing, and it's something that when you don't have it, well, I mean, to be honest, that's just where most of us live, Right? We're so used to people not paying attention to us or being distracted right, that we don't know how good it feels when people are fully there with you, when people actually care about you. They care about what you have to say. Right? And, and you know, when, when you talk to them, they're not in a rush. They're not in a hurry. They're, they're not like all jittery because they need to be somewhere else. Right? But they're just there with you. They care about you. They care about what you have to say, right? And then when you're done talking, then they share with you about their life, and you listen to them, right? And you're fully there, and you're fully present. Does that sound wonderful? That's the way community is supposed to be. That's what we are trying to learn to do, right? And friends, it costs no money, right, for us to be fully present. And so, you know, Peter and John, they look at this man and they're giving him their full undivided attention, right? Look at us. And so he does. And that's when the miracles start to happen, right? The second thing that we can give to other people is Christ in us, right? And so in this passage, um, we see uh, Peter says, I have no silver, uh, silver and gold, but what I do have... I give to you, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with, with them, walking and leaping and praising God. So Peter did not have money to give, but he gave this man the power of Christ, right? Right? In the name of Christ, get up and walk. Friends, you know, maybe you're thinking, well, Pastor Steve, I don't know how to, like, heal people like that. You know, and I don't think necessarily we need to do that. Not everyone has this gift that Peter had, right? But we all have Christ in us. And, and you know, we, we're learning how to have more of Christ in us right? The power of Christ, right? Think about, um, you know, what it means to be a Christian, a Christian, a little Christ. We are supposed to be like Christ, right? What does that mean? Well, when you look at, um, you know, the way that Jesus was with people, the ways that, that he loved people, the, the ways that he was patient with them, the ways that he was present with them, the ways that he didn't judge them, right? Like, think about, like, all the sinners and all the people who were approaching Jesus. And look at the way Jesus treated them versus the Pharisees, right? The way that Jesus loved people, it was just categorically different. And when you see Jesus' call to people, he says, you know, make disciples of all nations and teach them to do everything that I've taught you. 
Teach them to be like me. And as we learn in this life, as we are in this Christian journey, what we are learning is to become more and more and more like Christ. And this is what we have to offer other people. Right? I mean, for one, how are you going to learn how to do this? You're going to learn to do this when we model it to other people. Right? It's not just supposed to be words on a page. Oh, that's nice that Jesus was so loving. But you go to church and everyone is just as selfish and just as greedy and just as, as self-obsessed as everyone else in the world. Right? It's not supposed to be that way. Right? But when we go to church, we are uh, uh, mirroring Christ to one another. Right? We are learning to love and forgive the way that Christ loves and forgives us. And we project that to other people. Right? And what we have to offer more than anything else is the character that Christ is forming within us. Right? And we learn to give that to other people. And so, friends, what that means is we have to prioritize our life in Christ, right? Church is not just about what we do here, but it is about how we live every day. And learning to pursue Christ, learning to walk in faith. Yes, we have these moments in community where we get to model that to each other, but also in what we do at home. The whole purpose is that we become more like Christ. It's not just for you to get the right doctrines. It's not just for you to get more knowledge and to know lots of Bible, because I know people who know lots of Bible, and it can make them arrogant and proud. There are people who know lots of Bible who are like Christ, and there's people who know lots of Bible who are not like Christ, right? And so, friends, the, the, the purpose, I mean, this is supposed to be a tool. All of these things are for the purpose of helping you be formed into more Christ-likeness. And so this is what we have to give, whatever Christ has already given you, right? And when we are in community and we are like Christ to one another, oh man, the world notices. Look at the early Christian community. We are told that every day, there were people who were being saved every day because it was attractive. People saw this kind of community and they're like, man, this is different. Look at these people. Look at the way they live, right? And when church is doing it right, we're like that. We're attractive. People come and they genuinely feel welcomed. They genuinely feel loved. They don't feel judged. They don't feel like they have to play the status game like everyone plays in this world. But they're like, man, the people here, are, they're different. They're different. I, wanna, I want this. I want to be like this. I want to be a part of this community. I want to be like them. Right? And so that is one of the most important things that we can give, to give to other people the Christ that is in us. The third thing that we have to give is blessing. What is a blessing, friends? Well, so what you see uh, in Peter and John, you know, they were giving uh, what Christ had given them, right? The, the example that, that Jesus had taught them, right, how to heal other people. And so they're doing that, right? But what they're doing is not just giving them something arbitrary, but they're giving them a blessing. Right? What is a blessing? Uh, Dallas Willard defines a blessing as um, the will, a willing good or projecting good into another person. So the, the flip side of a blessing, the, the, the opposite of a blessing, is a curse. Right? And what is a curse? Willing or projecting evil into another person. Right? I hope bad things happen to you. Right? That's a curse. Right? And so Blessing is this idea that we desire good for other people and we are projecting it, right? We are willing it for other people. And you see that in this very tangible way in this passage, their desire for this man as they look at him and they're like, man, we do want to give you something. We want to give you your life back, right? That's their desire for them. And it's manifested in this miracle, right? But that desire, that projection, it's something that all of us can do, right? And when we pray for one another, that's what we're doing. We're trying to project good into other people, right? And, and I got to tell you, uh, so 
I just looked up like Google image search of blessing, and most of the pictures were like this, uh, what you see there. It's somebody like with open hands, right? And then there's like a light from heaven, right? And it's this idea that like God is giving you this blessing from heaven. And almost all of the images were like this, right? And almost all of the ways that we think about blessing is what's in it for me, right? Okay, God, give me something good. And that's true. God does want to bless you, right? God does want to project good into your life. That is very, very important. But what we have to give other people is the projection of good into their lives too. God wants to bless you, but he also wants you to be a blessing, right? That is God's desire for your life. And the community of Christ only works when we have both, right? We are a blessing through, through and through. You're being blessed and you're blessing. And it's just flowing, right? Unfortunately, in this world, because we're so self-focused, right? And we're, we're so self-interested, we're only focused on primarily, I should say, what can we get out of things? And most people approach church that way, right? And so we go to church and we're like, what am I going to get out of it, right? And nowadays, because we have so many churches, and you, you can get church online, right? And you can get church customized. I call it Starbucks church sometimes, right? Uh, and, and I say that sometimes, like, you know, you go to Starbucks, and you can get whatever you want exactly the way you want it. And if you don't get it exactly what you want, like, this isn't soy milk, right? I said no whipped cream. Man, if they mess it up, like, you're enraged. You're like, no, this is unjust. Like, I need my coffee exactly the way I want it. And a lot of us, we approach church this way. I need blessing, and I need it to come the way that I want it to come, right? I want the music to be the way I want the music to be. I want the message to be the way that I want it to be, right? I want the people to be the way that I want them to be. If I go to church and no one talks to me, I'm out of here. What kind of church is this? Right? And we're going to go and find a better Starbucks. Oh, sorry, church. We're going to find a better church that is going to give us what we want. And we're just like, okay, give it to me. Give it to me. Give it to me. But that's not what blessing is. Blessing is learning to project good to other people. Right? God is doing that into your life. Right? But the whole thing is that you are becoming one with Christ. And if you are going to learn to receive the good things from God, you got to learn to also give them, right? What would church look like if that's what we did? Now, friends, I, I, I want to just show you a blessing in the Bible. I actually uh, said this blessing last week in the video sermon. It's the Aaronic blessing. And I, I keep going back to this when it comes to blessings because it's really hard to improve upon this. But it's a very, very simple blessing. And so I, I just want us to take a look at these elements that are in it, right? It says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance. And there's a little, um, there's a little like uh, footnote there. And, and if you go to the footnote, what is countenance? What is countenance? Anyone know? Does anyone see? Uh, uh, sorry, you'd have to look it up. Anyone want to guess what countenance is? A, a synonym? A much simpler synonym? Face. It's face, right? And so it says, the Lord lift up his face upon you and give you peace. Why did they use the word countenance? Probably because they already used the word face, right? Because they, they, they felt like it was redundant. But friends, let me read it with face. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and give you peace. Friends, you know, I told you these are all interconnected, but does this kind of sound like the first point we were making? Being fully present with people, actually looking at them, actually being present, actually, you know, your face is, is pointed towards them. You're not looking at your phone, right? And, and friends, like, think about the face, this idea of um, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Uh, Dallas Willard says that if you want an example of this, look at the way a grandparent looks at their grandchild and their face just lights up, right? And, you know, the grandchild could be 
I mean, I'm, I'm sure just all the kids you know in your life are not like this, but the grandchild could be the biggest brat in the world, right? And the grandparent doesn't care. When they look at that kid, their face lights up, right? I mean, there's just so much joy. And it's not just joy. It's not just enjoyment, right? But you know, grandparents, man, they're always, like, giving to the kids, right? They always, like, you know, giving them sweets and giving them love and giving them attention. And, and just that joy, right? It's just flowing, you know? And friends, I, I wonder, when we think about the people in our lives, when we think about the people in our churches, is our attitude, is our, our, our way of being towards them, is it one of blessing, desiring good for them? You probably have some people in your life who bless you or who you've blessed, right? And there probably have been times when you meet with these people and you're not checking your phone, you're not thinking about these other things, you're just concerned about them, right? And when they share with you, you know, they're like, oh man, you know, I really, really want this job. And you're like, yeah, I really want this job for you. Oh my gosh, I hope you get this job. I hope it's awesome, right? You want good things for them. You want the best things for them. That's blessing. That's blessing. It's not just words that we say, but it's our whole sense of being towards another person. Can you imagine you come to a church where that is the standard operating procedure? Everyone there is there to bless other people and also to be blessed in return. Because I got to tell you, blessing is open hands. Open hands that are willing to give the blessing, but also willing to receive. I know sometimes, and I'm talking mainly to the leaders here, uh, there are some people who we've learned to serve and give and give and give and give, but for some reason we think receiving is less spiritual. And we think our role is that we're supposed to be the ones who give and give and give and give and give. And I got to tell you that sometimes that just becomes duty. It's not blessing anymore. And it will become blessing, and it will become joy if you learn also to receive. If you learn to, to, to open your hands, right? When you're giving, and other people start giving back to you, man, soak that in. It's so great. You go to church, and, and somebody is there, and they just have good intentions for you. Man, how are you doing? How are you doing? Have you ever met someone like that? Now, when they ask you, it's not just that question like, hey, what's up? And you're like, good? And they're like, okay, see ya. Like, they didn't answer the question correctly. You don't say, right, what's up? You say nothing. Right? You don't say good, right? But it's, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just a nothing statement that we say to each other. But have you ever met someone where they ask you that question, how are you doing? And you know that they mean it. You know they actually want to know. What if our entire community was like that? Every single person. We had good intentions for other people. And it doesn't mean you always have to say it, right? You don't always have to be, like, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. But it's just in your manner, right? That in here, we are desiring good things for other people in Christ. And we pray that. And we desire that. Friends, I want to close... Um, yeah, I, I just had this question. Can you imagine a church community where we come primarily to bless one another in Christ? And um, I had thought about doing this, because um, I've, I've done this before at retreats, where we take some time to bless one another, and I leave the ironic blessing up there, and then people can like speak a blessing on other people. And I've actually thought about doing that this morning. We're not going to do that. And some of you like kind of like laughed in a, a relieved way. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> and the reason why we're not going to do it is because I think sometimes it can be a little mechanical, especially when I force you, you know, and you're looking at the other person, you're all awkward. The Lord bless you and keep you. We don't want that. We don't want this mechanical kind of blessing. I want you to learn how to actually desire good things for other people. So this is what we're going to do instead. All right. I, I want you to take a moment, and, and if you could just close your eyes and just think of someone in this room, okay? Someone actually in this room, okay? Anyone. And think of them for a moment, and I want you to picture their face. 
And honestly, this is actually better to do if you don't happen to like this person, <laughs> just because it, it can help you. It can help you to uh, be a person of blessing. Um, but, but anyone, right? I mean, it could be someone in your family. It could be someone you came with. It could be someone that you maybe haven't talked to for a while, but you're like, oh, shoot, so-and-so's here. I want to say hi to them after the service. Can you just picture them smiling? For me, I like to do this. This isn't like a hard and fast rule or anything. This isn't legalistic. It's just easier for me to project good into someone else when I see them smiling. Man, you see someone smiling, it just makes you feel good, right? It makes you feel good things towards them. And so picture their face smiling. Can you do that? And I want you in your words and in your heart, in your intentions, to just desire good things for them. You may not know what that is. And so maybe just the word is, right? The Lord bless you. God bless Kate. God bless John, right? Whoever this is. And just take a moment to just desire good for them. God, I want good things for this person. I want the very best, what you have for them. All right, picture their face one more time, that smiling face, and just bless them. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face to you and give you peace. Amen. And friends, I, I just want to encourage you, let it be organic, right? But if you get a chance to either message this person or, you know, because they're in this room, right? You know, before you go out to just say a kind word to them, look them in the eye. I mean, it could just be like, bye, but you do it in a blessing way, right? You're desiring good for them, right? Can we do that? I think that would be an awesome thing. And man, can you just imagine if every Sunday, every Sunday we were doing that, what kind of community would that be? What kind of church would that be? That would be awesome, wouldn't it? Friends, I want to go into our time of communion. And in communion, Jesus shared... Uh